Welcome to Cat and Jess Talk the Best, where we're going to be talking about IMDb's top 250 movies from April 12th, 2018. My name is Cat, And I'm Jess. And today we are talking about number 192, The Grand Budapest Hotel, which is an adventure comedy crime film from 2014. It has an 8.1 on 644,853 votes. So before we get to our synopsis, we are going to reveal our mystery line from The Wages of Fear. And nobody was able to guess this one correctly. So I will read it. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. And that is from Sunset Boulevard. Yep. So there's that one. So we will, um, in Stand By Me is when we'll reveal our mystery line or our winner for our mystery line from stalker so we have this week we have three colors left we have purple light blue and green green all right greed for lack of a better word is good greed for lack of a better word is good That is our line for this week, and we will reveal the winner of that one in Network. Give you a couple of weeks to guess that. Alright, so our synopsis. In the 1930s, the Grand Budapest Hotel is the popular European ski resort, presided over by concierge Gustav H. Zero, a junior lobby boy, becomes Gustav's friend and protege. Gustav prides himself on providing first-class service to the hotel's guests, including satisfying the sexual needs of many of the elderly women who stay there. When one of Gustav's lovers dies, mysteriously, Gustav finds himself the recipient of a priceless painting and the chief suspect in her murder. Yeah, that's that's the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is directed by one of my favorite directors, Wes Anderson. Uh, he's also directed The Life of Aquatic with Steve Zizu, Fantastic Mr. Fox, and The Isle of Dogs. Isn't one of those on our list? Isn't it Fantastic Mr. Fox on our list? No, I don't think so. Oh, I thought it was. Because I remember our only stop-motion film is Mary and Max. Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't know what I was thinking then. I thought it was. Okay. It's all good. All right. So this stars um, Ray Fiennes, F. Murray Abraham, and Matthew Almerich. Yeah. Those are the top three build. And we got some other cool cameos in there. Uh, One of which is Bill Murray, who we have had before. Mm Mm-hmm. Bill Murray, Edward Norton. Uh, we've had Ed- have we had Edward Norton in a movie yet? Uh, let me see real quick. Mm. That we have. I'm looking. Mm, I don't see him as one of the main three, at least. Oh, we have have had Jeff Goldblum as well. He's in yes, this. Jeff Goldblum. Love him. Had him in Jurassic Park. Yes. It's like, Wes Anderson likes just to get a bunch of random actors together for his movies, so. Yeah. And there is, especially for this one. Um, so, on IMDb, 31.3% of users rated this at an 8. Metacritic, it has an 88 91% on 296 critical reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. So, too fresh. Kate Murr, discerning travelers and Wes Anderson fans will luxuriate in the glorious middle European kish of one of the director's funniest and most exquisitely designed movies in years. I agree. I really do. I completely agree with that. 
I gotta look, but I'm pretty sure this is the only movie I've seen from him. There's so many more! <laughs> I know, he has a ton. Because I have, like, a list of movies I want to watch, but I've been so busy lately. But now, it should be good. But yeah, so I'll be able to watch more things that I want to, and, like, do more things that I want to do, so that's good. So, Richard Corliss, grand isn't good enough a word for this Budapest hotel. Great is more like it. I yep. think that's funny. It's like the Great Budapest Hotel. If it was named the Great Budapest Hotel, that would just be weird. I think the Grand Budapest Hotel works better. <laughs> yeah. Like, I understand what he's getting at, but I'm just like, no, it can't be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, too rotten. Amanda Griever. I didn't find it amusing, and while I can appreciate the creativity, it's an hour and 40 minutes I wish I could take back. I'm going to tend to agree more with her. I didn't really find it that amusing, but I... I did appreciate the creativity, but I also don't think, like, like yeah, it was cool that I watched it, but I'm not like, I need my hour and a half back. Like, I'm not going to go that far. I was like, because that's kind of a dick move to say. Yeah. Like, there's some other movies, yeah, I want my time back from watching them, but this one, no, I mean, this one was decent at least. Like, it wasn't my favorite, and I don't think it was great, but it was good. Because you're also not a comedy person either. Yeah. And this is way more comedy than I was expecting it to be. Like, literally, <laughs> every word out of their mouth is comedy, pretty much. Oh, it's beautiful to me. But I love comedy. So, the next one. Pat Padua. Like a beautiful stacking Petrushka doll. Open up another and another of its layers until you reach an empty center. Oh, I know what he's talking about. Those little dolls. Those ouch. Are, I love those little dolls. Those are cute. I know, but that... Ouch. That's harsh. Ouch. <sighs> that's like a burn. Like, major burn. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so the consensus. Typically stylish, but deceptively thoughtful, the Grand Budapest Hotel finds Wes Anderson once again using ornate visual environments to explore deeply emotional ideas. Yeah, I will agree. The visuals of this, like all the cinematography, was great. Yeah, he does a really good job consistently like that. A lot of his movies are just like this. His, his, this movie was beautiful. It just was not great, in my opinion. In Kat's opinion, yeah. In my opinion, yeah. I was like, I was I, thinking to myself, when you, like, when you're going to watch it, I'm like, she might not like this. She might. But probably not. But because I know you. Yeah, I... See, the story and... Well, we'll get to that. Never mind. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the money... The budget was $25 million. Opening weekend, it made, uh, for its limited release, it made $811,166. For its wide release, it made $8,539,795. Domestically, it made $59,301,325. Internationally, Hundred fifteen million five hundred thousand for a worldwide total of one hundred and seventy four million eight hundred one thousand three hundred and twenty four dollars. So it made quite a bit of money. It was very popular, and I think that's part of the reason why this Wes Anderson movie is on the list is because of how popular it was. Yeah, he has a lot of good movies, but they're more of like people don't know about them. Yeah. Which bugs me. <laughs> um, so the all-time domestic rank is 1,407. So on to the awards. Um, this one has a lot of awards. Um, it did win four Oscars. 
It had 129 other wins and 219 nominations. So once again, with the ones that have a lot of awards, we're just going to go Academy Awards, Golden Globes, and BAFTAs. So the four Oscars that it won, Best Achievement in Costume Design, Best Achievement in Makeup and Hairstyling, Best Achievement in Music Written for Motion Picture Original Score, Best Achievement in Production Design. I will agree with most of those. I wasn't a big fan of the score, but the other three, the production design, makeup and hair, and costume, I loved them all. Golden Globes, Best Motion Picture, Comedy or Musical, which is the second biggest award in the Golden Globes. BAFTA Awards, Best Original Music, Best Costume Design, Best Production Design, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Hair and Makeup. Makeup and, and it's hair. like, I would like to say also with the Oscars that the director was nominated for Best Director and is also nominated for Best Picture. What year was this? 2015? Let's see what won. Yes. What won? Hold on. It was something else. <laughs> I just can't th- remember the movie. No, I know. I just like I just thought it was funny the way you said that. It was something else. Like I wish it was like, this. Like you I were was... about to say what it was, and you're like, oh, never mind. I don't know. Well, I kind of remember, but oh, I, I remember. It out. I remember because this is one that we've actually had on our list. I just I just looked at it. It's Spotlight one. Yeah, I wish this had won. Uh, I like Spotlight better, so I'm glad that Spotlight won. But that's my own opinion, so. That's very true. In my opinion, I like this one better. It's different than the other ones that were in the category. I don't know what else was in the category, but I do know that, um. A bunch of other drama films is why. See, but I love dramas, so I always want them to win. And I don't! (laughs) They drag on sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, but. They're just intense. (laughs) They're intense. That's what I like. Okay, so initial thoughts. Um, do you want to go? Do you want to go first? Because sure. my my initial watch was last week, so I I remember this very, um, very clearly. I'm trying to remember if I saw this in the theaters. I don't think I did, mostly because our theater sucks and doesn't bring movies like this. Um, I do remember watching it like as soon as it came out, like on like DVD and all that, and I absolutely loved it. I did. But again, I'm also a big Wes Anderson fan. And then I was like, Ray Fiennes in this? Voldemort? All right. You know, I wanted yeah. to see how he was in like more of a comedic role. He was amazing. Loved him. He was great as Gustav H. Like, it was different from like some of his other things he's ever done, which I really liked. I'm like, yay. See, he could be a comedic actor too. I mean, I loved the visuals in this. Yeah. Great color scheme. I liked the story. I did. I really did. And, like, the comedy to me wasn't too much in your face. Because I've had seen some more comedies that were, like, all up in your face, as I want to say. Mm-hmm. And this wasn't. This is more subtle comedy, which I like. Maybe, so maybe it's just the fact that I don't watch comedies, but this felt very in your face to me because it's just like constant. Oh, here's another funny line. Here's another funny line. Here's another funny moment. And I'm just like, can we please stop? Can we just have a little bit of seriousness in this thing, please? There was some seriousness in there. Not enough for me. Of course. (laughs) I was like, but like with this movie, I like, I don't know. This is probably one of my favorite Wes Anderson movies. It really mm-hmm. is. Like, yeah, I can't say enough about it. I always recommend this movie to whoever I talk to. I really mm-hmm. do. I've been trying to get Logan to watch it. He said he wants to watch it. So, I'm like, yes. Good. So, so like, the day before I was going to watch this movie, I have to... So, we have a new rule for me and Sean. If I want him to watch a movie with me, I have to show him the trailer before we watch it. Okay. <laughs> Because I took him to see Midsummer, and he was very, very <laughs> mad at me. Because <laughs> I didn't tell him what it was about. I only told him the... I didn't even tell him the title of the movie. I just told him it was, like, a thriller. 
I didn't show him the trailer, and I made him go see that with movie with me. And that's like a long movie, so now from now on, I ever since that, he's like, you have to show me the trailer before we go see any movie or before we watch any movie at home. And I was like, okay, fine. But I really wanted him to go see that movie with me because I was super excited for that movie because I really like Ari Aster. I've only seen his two. I've only seen two movies because it's all he's made so far. But still. I really like him, but um, I ha- I showed him the day before I was going to watch this. I showed him the trailer. I was like, do you want to watch this movie with me? Because I was thinking what I knew about it. I was thinking, oh, maybe he would like it. And he watched the trailer and he has very similar tastes to me in movies, except for horror. He does not like those. So it's literally like the only difference we have in movie tastes. Well, and he likes Fast and Furious a lot and I don't but I watched them. <laughs> <laughs> That's besides the point. But so I showed it to him and he's like, no, I don't want to watch this movie. And I hadn't watched the trailer because I was just like, oh, I'm just going to go watch it. I don't care because I don't really care about watching trailers too much. Um, but as soon as he was like, no, like his, his was a definite no. And I was like, oh crap, I'm going to hate this movie. <laughs> and so then the next day I watched it and I watched the first 20 minutes of it and fell asleep because I was just so tired. It was a long week that week when I watched it. But um, then I woke up from my nap and I watched the rest of it. And it actually wasn't terrible. Um, I was because I was thinking, you know, it's going to be bad. It's going to be hard to watch because of Sean's reaction to the trailer. And then I watched it, and I was like, okay, it's it's super comedy, but I'm not big on comedies. Um, but the story is good. I liked the story. And like I said earlier, it's beautiful. It's just that it's just too much comedy. Like, I feel too like Too much I, comedy for Cat. It is. <laughs> oh. I like it. I like comedy. Like, I don't even... I don't like comedy. So I like it when I'm watching a movie and I don't expect something to be funny and then all of a sudden it's funny. But that's also because what I find funny is way different than what a lot of other people find funny. I know. So. <laughs> yeah. I knew. That's why I was like, Jess, remember, Kat does not like comedy very much. and She's probably not going to like it very much either. So. Yeah. Just prepare yourself for that. <laughs> but yeah. It wasn't... As bad as I thought it was going to be. Oh, and then also I remember when I... Because I remember hearing about this movie. And for some reason, in my head, I had it stuck in my head that it was a musical. Until I did my research about it. And then I was like, oh, this is not a musical. <laughs> I, I'm just still puzzled about that. I'm like, I don't know. Just like... Musical? But just the name of this movie screams musical to me. I don't know why. Maybe it's the use of the grand, like the grand Budapest hotel, just that grand part that just screams musical. I don't know why. I'm like, what musicals have that in their name? No, none of them. I'm just like, to me, that just says musical to me. I don't know why. Because, you know, people just don't use grand really much anymore. So are you saying musicals are old? Most of them, yeah. Rude. Have you? Oh my god. No, yeah. I haven't. I know what your question was. I have not I was seen like, recent musicals. <laughs> I'm like, really? I mean, Hamilton's a great example. Hamilton's a book. Hamilton's a musical. Yep. A badass musical. That I will never see. It's amazing. <laughs> I think that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> all right that was your warning if you haven't watched the film yet then stop listening and come back after you've watched it so you really like this movie so i'm gonna let you take the reins and i'll just interject when I have something to say. <laughs> All right. And I figured that would happen. All right. <laughs> I'm like, so well, I don't like, I know you like this movie and I don't want to like drag it down or anything because I don't hate it. 
I just want to listen to your opinion and get your opinion on it. So, go okay, ahead. Cap. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, Lord. All right. So, I will admit this starts kind of like, you're like, okay, what's going to happen here? So, see this girl walking through a cemetery, right? And she's got a book in her hand. And she puts this key on this podium of, like, there's, like, a bust of somebody. Yeah. And, um, and it shows a... Her book cover, it says the Grand Budapest Hotel. See, okay. Sorry, I'm gonna... Sorry. <laughs> Go. <laughs> if... But if this was a book, I would probably read the book. Because yeah. just looking at it and knowing, like, what the story is, I would want to read this as a book. Like, seeing that cover and then knowing what the story is. Like, presuming I had read the back cover of it. Because that's what I do. And then I open it and I read a page. Um... I would want to read this. So I don't know if that makes you feel better. Like, if it was a book, I'd read it. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, God. I know. I mean, I would love to read it as a book, too, but it's not a real book. I know. I saw it and I got excited because I thought it was a book, and then I looked it up and it wasn't, and I was sad. It's like, no, it's not a real book. <laughs> it's not. And then it goes to the actual author, and it's in... 1985, if I remember the number correctly. Yeah. And yeah, he's I wrote talking it about um, how we got the story for the uh, Grand Budapest Hotel. And it was like, it's like, I think it's like his grandkid or something, just like interrupting him. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's a typical kid. I mean, come on. Okay, this part I did find funny. He's like sitting there trying to do the interview and he like look, glances over at him and then looks back and keeps going. And then he glances over at, a, at him again and he goes, no, no, don't hit me with that. No. <laughs> <laughs> that did have me cracking up, I will admit. Because I'm just like, yeah, a kid would do that. A yeah. A kid would definitely do that. I mean, a kid licked my arm last night. So, I mean, I'm just like, it's a kid. Yeah. And so um, it goes back to um, like early, early. Um, like years before, and it's the young author. 1968. Yes, thank you. I wrote down that one. I thought the numbers were important, so I wrote them down. They are. Thank you for reminding me about that. You're and I guess who the young author is. Oh, I know it. I don't know his name, but I know him. Uh, he plays Dumbledore in, yes. um, in Fantastic Beasts. Yes, it's Jude Law. Yes, I was like, I can't remember his name, but I know him. <laughs> yes, a young, it's like, yep, the young author is Jude Law, and he is, um, an, he's, you know, a writer, and so he's staying at the Grand Budapest Hotel, and this is like in the off season, you know, because the hotel is, you know, for skiing and everything. Yeah. And so, this is their off season, so there's not that many people there, and it's really solitary, and... <sighs> and it says he was talking with, like, you know, the... The concierge at the time, Mr. Yeah. Jean. And he's like asking about like this old man that's just sitting there in the lobby. They're like, You don't know who that is? <laughs> You're like, That's uh, Mr. Mustafa, who owns the hotel. Yeah. And he also used to be the lobby boy there. And um, so, um, well, his name's Zero, so Zero Mustafa. And he likes to, every time he comes, he spends a lot of time there. And he likes to stay in his old room. Yeah. Okay, which is like a really small little place and everything. Um, and so you see the author now in the, like this like bathhouse or something, you know. And then you hear um, Mustafa, Zero. Um, they just start talking in the bathhouse. And he's like, um, these authors like in him are talking about like, well, how'd you get to own the hotel and all of that? And he's like, how'd you buy it? And he's like, I did it. Yeah. He's like, I didn't buy the hotel. He's like, and he asked him, like, to dinner so he can explain everything. And, um, so they're having dinner, and he starts telling the story about how he, about the Brand Budapest Hotel and Monsieur Gustave, which is in 1932. Yes. Jump to 1932 now. And most of the movie is actually in 1932. Yeah, because um, it does kind of jump a little bit back and forth to Jude Law and uh, the guy playing Zero. It jumps a little bit back and forth, but um, mostly it just stays on the 1932 timeline. Yes, it does. And 
I do want to say something about the actress playing the old woman. I don't remember her name. Let me see if I can find it. It's got to be in here. It's somewhere. Tilda. Tilda Swinton. Yep, there she is. So I think I do like her as an actress. Um, and I think it really says something about Wes Anderson that she would just straight up be like, oh, yeah, for sure. I'll play like a 90 year old woman for you. I guess it's true. It says something about his directing style and how well he does with people to get someone as great an actress as Tilda Swinton to play a 90-year-old woman in a movie for him. Oh, yeah. She's done a bunch of movies with him. She has. Like, I really I really like her. But she oh, also good. she does a great job playing in a lot of um, horror movies. Well, not yes. really. Like a lot of suspenseful type movies. And that's where I learned about her and, like, learned to love her and stuff. So, <laughs> she, even though she's not in this one very much, I just thought it, was, it said something about the director that she was in this and what her role in was, the role was in this, so. Yes, I hear he's just very easy to work with. Pretty laid back, dude. Yeah, and I hear that he makes it fun. Yes. Like, I do have one piece of trivia for this that I'll save for later, but it's, like, part of the making it fun thing, so. Oh, yeah. He does. He always makes it fun. Um, what else? Yeah. She is, as like, it's funny because I know her from, like, these type of movies and from, uh, what is it, Constantine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know Constantine. I was like, that's what I know her from. <laughs> It was like, these weird, quirky movies, like Wes Anderson <laughs> films, and it's Constantine. I know, weird mix there, but. All right, so it jumps to uh, Mr. Gustav, and he's, you know, helping Tilda Swinton's character. He's like, because, like, she was about to leave, because um, she'd been staying there a while, and she's afraid to leave. She doesn't yeah. want to, because she thinks something's going to happen. And he's like, she'll be, I'm like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you know, don't worry about it. And he's like, and he looks at her nails, she's like, oh, I hate that color, though. <laughs> yeah. That made me giggle. I, I mean, will he's like, say, he's, he's like, really? Very, he's a very eccentric character. I love his character. Like, I wish he had got nominated for an Oscar. That's how much I loved his character. And I was like, you got robbed. You got robbed. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so, like, he sends her off, and every, like, before he sends her off, she asks him to, like, you know, light a candle in, like, the church for her. Yeah. And he's like, I'll do it myself and everything. And he sends her away, and, like, Zero, this is now young Zero. Yeah. He's like, he's like, uh, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, well, I'm the new lobby boy. He's like, calls up to the owner, and he's like, um, how did you let him get hired without telling me about it? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say something about this actor too. It took me a good thirty minutes to figure out who he was, and I was like, "Oh, Spider Man!" Yeah, finally figured it out, and I was so excited because he plays such an asshole in Spider Man, and then yes. he plays like such a little timid guy, like a little timid. Like he's probably about I want to say like nineteen twenty in this, um, like at least character wise, and I was yeah. just. He does. It's cool when you get to see actors play completely different roles, because there's a lot of actors that play the same role a lot. And so I was just super excited that um, he was in this and he was playing like something completely different. Because that makes me start liking actors the more I can see them playing different roles rather than the same role over and over. Yes, it helps show them that they're like kind of a well-rounded actor. Yeah. That's why I liked Ray Fiennes in this. Yeah. <laughs> I was super happy with his performance in this. Even though it was a comedy, I was super happy with how he did. Because, you know, we saw him in, what it was, it, four, five movies? Four movies as Voldemort. So, yeah. It's or, good like, to see you have that Voldemort memory. In, well, and we're going to have him, like, way later on the list, in Schindler's List. Yeah. Because he's in that one. That's really serious. So that's it's nice seeing him in a. It's nice to see him in something completely different. Yeah, it's nice to see him in a role that he gets to kind of have fun with. Like, yeah, okay, he could. He probably had fun with Harry Potter, but it's different being the bad guy. Oh yeah. 
I gotta lie, it'd probably be pretty fun to play the bad guy. Oh, definitely. (laughs) Okay, sorry, continue. I told you, I was just gonna interject. I know, and it's fine. I like your interjections. They're they're working so far. Okay. (laughs) Um, and so, like, he just starts randomly, like, interviewing him as they're walking through the hotel and everything. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that works. He's like, you're gonna be, like, you know, stick with me, and I'll help you out and everything. So, that works out. And then, um, like, it says to a month later, um, Zero, of course, is, uh, Gustav's mentor. I'm sorry, flipped it around. Gustav is Zero's mentor. And, um, he's like, a lobby boy should be silent, Uh but always, like, present. Always ready to anticipate whatever's gonna happen. Whatever needs are needed. And, um, what was it? And uh, it's, it talks about how Major Gustav is always, uh, always make sure he's, uh, very servitable to the, uh, old rich ladies. Yeah. Let's just say that. <laughs> it says in the synopsis, too, but, you Yeah, know. I thought when I, because, like, the beginning of the movie when he's talking to Tilda, I was like, okay, maybe this is, like, his actual wife. And no. I was thinking, I was like, okay, that's kind of weird, but okay. And then we get going and they start talking about it more. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of gross. He likes them old. <laughs> and it's got to be old, blonde, and rich. Yeah. Old, blonde, and rich. I wrote down, like, uh, it's like rich, old, vain, insecure, blonde, needy, superficial. <laughs> yep. Those are the ones. I thought that was funny that he just, like, starts li- listing it all off. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And it talks about how Zero's, like, he's always working there at the hotel. Like, he doesn't have very much time off. Yeah. It's like, he works, what is it, like, six and a half days? Like, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is a long time to be working. That's crazy. And, uh, what was it? You see how everyone eats together except Major Gustav. He's by himself. I'm like, huh. Shows a lot about his character there. Because, you know, he likes to be, like, in front of all these other people, you know, like, always helping, always serving and everything. But then when he gets his time alone, he gets his time alone. (laughs) Yeah. He enjoys it. He'd rather have his, you know, his meal alone or something like that. It just shows, like, a little bit to his character. So I wrote that down. And then we meet, of course, Agatha. Agatha. Agatha is, um, she works out at the bakery. Yep. And uh, she makes sweets, and she delivers on her bike. And Zero, of course, really likes Agatha and everything. Yeah. It's very Um, cute. I do want to say one thing about the little pastries she's making. Not only do I think that they are cute and that I want to make them, but apparently, so I've heard on um, one of the special features of, like, the Blu-ray or whatever, um, they teach you how to make those little cookies. That is apparently. awesome. So I was like, I need to get the Blu-ray so I can make those little cookies, please. That is awesome. <laughs> because she had to make them. That's probably why they have a recipe for it, is because she actually had to make them. Yes, because it's a big part of the story. Yeah. It is. It's not just, like, a little side thing, just introduced and then, like, goes away. No, there's a reason why that's it's there. Yeah. And, and why it, she's there. That's something else. Like, it looks like it... He did a really good job of um, making it look like it's just a random thing. Like, oh, this is what she does. Like, kind of a random thing. But then later... He did a great job, I think, of integrating it into the story of her, how she can help later. Yeah. With her profession without, like, because sometimes you get stories where you get this woman introduced and this is what her profession is. And then all of a sudden she is a black belt in karate and you're just like, where the fuck did that come from? Exactly. I like it. I like how she just slipped in really quickly. And then she goes back out. Then she comes back later in the movie. And you're like, oh, there's a reason why. You know? Alright. Yeah, so then, I liked that. Yeah, I do. I like, I, I just like Wes Anderson, so I'm always going to praise yeah, him. Yeah, I mean, 
other than the fact like how comedic this movie was most everything else i did like about the movie i liked his intentions i liked us i will say it again and i will never stop saying it the cinematography of this movie just completely blew me away so this movie without actually liking the comedic part of it makes me really want to watch some of his other movies oh good because like- i did like most everything about it <laughs> Except for the comedy. So, it gets to part two, it says. And this is talking about the madam that we learned about earlier, Tilda Swinton's part. Yep. Um, So, um, Zero is getting the papers and everything. And he sees something in the paper. And he's like, rushes back really quick to the hotel. And it's actually really cool how he does it. He has to, like, ride the train and, like, this... What would you call that? What would I call the train? Well, not the train. It's like this little cart riding up the side of the mountain. Oh, um, like a... God. I can't think of the word right now. Oh, well, let's just call it a buggy. Yeah, that works. And it's going <laughs> up and everything. I thought that was so cool. It did. It was really cool looking to me. And he, like, he goes and, like, gives the papers to, uh, shows Mr. Um, Gustav that, like, on the paper it says that she was killed. Yeah. Oh, time out. Hold on. I figured out um, at least one other movie that Amer- that Edward Norton is in. In our uh, list? He, on our list. Number 32, American History X. Oh, yeah. He's in that one. Um, and Mr. Gustav's like, we got to go to her. And so, like, they um, they get on the train and everything. And... Misha Gustav saying, like, you know, oh, she, like, had a premonition that she was going to die or something like that. She told me yeah. this. And he's, like, you know, she was great in the sack. And Zero's, like, she was, like, in her 80s. He's, like, oh, I felt older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that line. I'm, like, oh, God, really? <laughs> he's, I mean, it's just, like, Zero's face just at that point. It was just, like, my face, yeah. too. He's, like, uh, Okay. Little gross for his taste, but all right. <laughs> and so they have to, they get, the train gets stopped and it's, um, the soldiers come in cause it's the closing of the, the frontier. Cause it's like 1930s in, in Europe. So things are starting to happen. And, uh, the soldiers are checking their papers and they see that, um, zero is an, uh, an immigrant. And everything, yeah. and, like, his papers, like, aren't all the way correct and everything. And so, <laughs> Richard Gustav's, like, trying to help defend him and everything. He's, like, a little scuffle. And then, of course, guess who comes in? Edward Norton's character. Yeah. And he's like, and... oh, he's like, I know Mr. Gustav, you know. He's like, because my parents used to go to the hotel all the time. And he's like, oh, yeah, you were a little kid when I saw you last and everything. And so he, like, lets him go and everything. And Edward Norton's character gives him, like, a little card that's saying, like, just carry this around. You'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so I do want to say something about Edward Norton in this movie specifically. Like, I do like him as an actor. I've never really had an issue with him other than this movie. To go me... On. In this movie, he any except for this first time we really see him, every other time we see him, he just kind of seems a little bland to me, and I don't know if that's the way he was told to portray his character or if that's just how he chose to portray it. But I didn't like how he portrayed his character in this movie. Oh, I can see what you mean by that. I can. Yeah, I didn't think I, it was bland. I think he was more trying to act like a, how do I describe it? It just seemed really emotionless and... That's kind of how, they. I think he's trying to portray, like, how, like, some cops can be. Yeah. That's what I was getting it from. Okay. But, again, I know cops. <laughs> My mom works at the police department, so I know some. So, I could, I can relate to it. Okay. But I have a background of it, so that's why. I just wasn't a big fan of how he portrayed his character in this. Like, most of the time, like, anything else I've ever seen him in, I was 
okay with how he did his character. Like, I liked how he was acting and stuff, but this one, I just wasn't a big fan of it. I get you. I mean, he's not that big of a character in this, so. Yeah. Alright, um, so they get to the madam's house, and you, like, they're like, I need to see her. And so, like, they direct her, like, her, like, butler, and, like, one that's, like, maids and everything, direct Major Gustav to, of course, her coffin. And she's just laying there, and I'm like, okay, that's interesting. You know, like, no top on and everything, this dead woman just laying there. <laughs> this part, I was just like, I was thinking about this last night. How, um, he's like looking at her, he's like, you look better in death than you did when you were alive. He's like, whatever face cream they're using, I want some. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, and you changed your nails. He's like just commenting on this, like, the randomest shit. Yeah. And then he like, he sees like, the lore, like, some people go by, like, and he like, he's like, what's going on? And so they go and see, like, this big old room full of people. And it looks like they're reading her will. Yeah. And, and she just standing, like, he stands in the back, of course, and everything and listens. And um, the first it says is that, you know, uh, this is uh, Jeff Goldblum's character. Correct? Yeah. Um... What's his character name? I'm trying to remember. Mm, let's see. Starts with a K. Deputy Kovacs? Kovac. Kovac. There we go. Kovac. Thank you. I was like, it starts with a K. It's in my nose. I just didn't have it right, <laughs> right there. So he's reading the will and everything, you know. Like her son gets the money and everything. And but then there's another letter saying that she gave. Um, She's giving Major Gustav this very famous painting called Boy with Apple. And everyone's just pissed off because he got it. Yeah. And, he, and uh, Major Gustav's like, that thing is very valuable. He's like, it's beautiful. You know? And then, like, um, they're like, well, who the hell is Major Gustav? And he's like, I'm right here. <laughs> and then, of course, um, Dimitri, that's uh, her son. It's played by Adrian Brody. Um, <laughs> he goes up to her, he's like, um, to Mr. Gustav, and he's like, he's like, how the hell do you know my mother? And like, have you laid a hand on my mother and all things? Like, calls him all kinds of names and everything. And <clears throat> he like punches him, of course. And then there's like a little fight right there. Yeah. It's like the basic reaction of a kid whose mom or dad has started dating someone else and they're mad about it. Pretty much. And of course, it's a full grown man. So. Yeah. Mm. You also see a little bit of Willem Dafoe's character in this scene, too. Yeah. <laughs> but I love Willem Dafoe, too. So. I like this movie, just see, full yeah, of I'm, actors I love. I'm so used to him playing a villain that when I see him not playing a villain, I'm just like, why? Like, no, he does play, like, a bad guy in this one. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, uh, some, something else I saw recently. Oh, Aquaman, he doesn't play a villain. So when I watched it, I was expecting him to be the villain in Aquaman, and he wasn't. <laughs> and then I'm just like, wait, why? That's what he does. <laughs> Wait, Why? <laughs> Because, like, like I said earlier, I do like to see them play things other than what they do, but then if they play something so much, like, if they play the villain or the bad guy or something so much, that's what I get attached to them as. <laughs> so, like, it can, for me, it can go either way, um, acting-wise. Like, if you play a specific character and you do it really well, that's all I ever want to see you in. But then if you also have that diverse ability of playing different characters, then yes, I do want to see you in that, but I've gotten so attached to Willem Dafoe being a bad guy that I'm just like, nope, he needs to be a bad guy. I was like, you need to see him in uh, Life Aquatic then, because he's not a bad guy. At all. I'm, I'm going to be upset because he's not the bad guy. <laughs> he's not. He's actually, like, I love his character in Life Aquatic. It's a great character. I mean, and in, uh, was it Boondock Saints? Yeah. He's not really the bad guy know. either. Yeah, that's true. 
As like, so I don't always think the man's a bad guy, but I can definitely see why you do. For sure. I do. I see it. Yeah. All right. Um, so then, like, Zero and Gustav talk about the painting, like, why it's important. So they go look at it. And, um, and Zero's like, just, just take it. <laughs> and so they take the picture down and put up this other picture. And this picture is so raunchy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's a great. I was. I just every time I watch that part, I just start laughing, because you don't know what to expect. Like, yeah, what kind of picture are they gonna that. pull out? I was like, what the <laughs> heck? Oh yeah, those two ladies. That's all I'm gonna say. Two ladies, and so um, they get uh, one of the maids to help um, wrap up the painting, and like the butler slips something an a letter, like an envelope. This is confidential behind the painting, which is important. Yeah. It is. And he slips it on the back of it and, like, finishes, like, wrapping it up. And so um, they leave, and they're, like, on the train it back, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do with the painting. They're like, we should hang on to it. So and then, like, the, five minutes later, like, no, let's sell it. <laughs> the, the part with the butler, Yes. I think I was writing something down, so I missed that. So later on, when that comes back into play, I was like, where the fuck did that come from? <laughs> I'm so confused. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like, that's kind of an important part. Yeah. <laughs> whoops a daisy And then, so, like, on the train, like, like Gustav's like, he's like, well, I don't know, he's like, I don't have any kids or anything or family. And so he's like, you know what, I'm gonna make you zero like my heir and so like he has like zero right like this entire thing down so you know you know if everything happens to me you know you get everything yeah i'm like that's important too even if it doesn't seem like it it is yeah it is towards the end it is and then um they're back at the hotel and everything and they had hid the painting in like this safe and the police come, and they're asking to see uh, Major Gustav. Yep. And they're saying that, um, the police are saying that uh, Gustav's the one who killed uh, the madam. And uh, he's like, he's like, oh, well, and then he just, like, runs away. I'm like, that makes it worse for you. Yeah, it's like you should just stay and answer the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, um, so they catch him, of course, and then he gets arrested and all that. And, uh, it says one week later, and Zero's visiting Gustav in the, uh... Prison camp. Prison thing. Which, it's, uh, Checkpoint 19, I think is what it's called. Yeah, I don't remember the exact name of it. I wrote it down, but I don't remember if that's just the gate that he went in, or if that's what the place is actually called. So. I don't know. <laughs> and, um... It's saying, um, Zero's telling how, um, it was reported that, um, that uh, Gustav had, would have been there, like, hours or so before Madame had died, was killed, she discovered killed. And, uh, the only witness that was there, that saw everything, and could relate, and, you know, could try to clear his name, was the butler, but he had gone missing. Yeah. He, like, ran off or something. And so, um... Of course, Zero, of course, has, like, a little box of, like, the candies, like, the sweet cookie and everything. And he gives to Gustav. Um, and then it jumps to, um, this is, uh, Willem Dafoe's character. His name's Dropling. Yep. And it goes to, um, he's visiting, um, the butler's sister to see if he's hiding there or something like that. And he gives her a card. He's like, he's like, well, if you see him, and it says, like, his name and all on it and everything. And um, and then uh, Muj, uh, Gustav had wrote a letter to the Budapest hotel staff. He's like telling them, like you know, keep everything like if I was still here, you know, if you if anything goes wrong, Zero's gonna tell me. Yeah. And um, then you hear like um, Joplin's talking to somebody on the phone. You don't realize who it is until later. Okay, I won't say now. <laughs> and um, 
Gustav is, you know, back, it's back in the jail. Gustav's um, doing, like, food duty and everything. He's trying to give out some, what was it? <sighs> uh, like, like slosh or something? Like, yeah, some kind of slosh soup thingy. And he's like, it just needs a little salt, then it's good. You know? Yeah. And then he had, like, he, um, he goes to this one part, this one little area where, like, these are these guys here. They're all grouped together, and he takes out that, that treat that uh, Zero had brought him. It's called, it's the, the bakery shop's called Mendel's. And he, yeah. like, cuts it up and everything, and they'll eat it. And they're like, you know what? I think we can trust this guy. And so they, like, pull out this big old map, and they're like, okay, we're going to help you escape, but we want to come, too. Yeah. And they're like, we just need to figure out a way to get, like, tools to start digging. And then they look at the Mendel's box, and they're like, no one wants to, like, cut open, like, one of those, because they're so yeah. pretty to look at. So they're going to get Agatha to hide tools in, like, the cookies that they sent. And then, like, it's, this is a part where the, um, Zero starts to, stops talking, because he's narrating this entire thing. He just stops. He's like, it's just so hard for me to talk about Agatha. And we're like, what? Why is it so hard for him? You find out later why, but. Yeah. And, uh, so, like, and then it talks about, um, he, so he starts continuing talking about Agatha. He says that, um, they'd been dating for a little bit, and so he asked her to marry him, and she agreed, and he gives her, like, this book of poems that, um, Major Gustav had recommended. Yeah. And then, of course, it jumps to, uh, Gustav's interviewing Agatha, Saying, make sure she, you know she's good enough for zero. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh my god, leave him alone. I thought it was funny. I just remember that part clearly in my head. Um, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, and he's like, yeah, I prove her. She's good. So like, she makes the cookies and everything, and they get past security, and so they're using it to uh, dig a hole in their jail cell. Yeah. And then it goes to, um, Kolbeck is, um, going through all these documents and at, um, Madam's house and everything. Well, actually, not his house. It's, um, in Kolbeck's office, if I remember correctly, because his cat's uh, yeah, there. Think, yeah, I think so. I was so mad at this part. I was thinking you'd be Oh, kidding. I know. Don't get me It's not, not even funny. Nothing, like, what the f- mm, I know, I know, I'm let mad. me get to it, let me get to it. <laughs> so, um, he's saying, like, well, there's something's missing, there's, like, a letter or a thing missing, and they're like, he's like, we need to, like, report this, and Dimitri's like, oh, no, let's just push this all through, and let me have my money. Yeah. And Galvai's like, no, I can't do that, that's illegal. And- so, the part that makes Cat angry, <laughs> um, Joplin's there, and he grabs Colbeck's cat, and Lily just <sighs> throws him out the throws it out the window, window. throws it out the window, and, and you know, dead cat on the concrete yeah. below. <laughs> and um, again, the cars are digging the hole and everything, and and um, so it goes to um, Agatha and Zero. They're talking, you know, they're in her little place. And yeah. Zero's, like, gives her this little piece of paper. Yep. He's like, if anything happens, you know, I want you to, you know, take this and use it. And she's like, I'm not gonna do that. And she's like, just take it. And then he has yeah. to leave. Um, so, and then it goes to, back to Jeff Goldblum's character, um, Colvax. He, he has, he's walking out of his place, and, uh, his, like, office, I guess. And he's got, like, I know, this is so gross looking, but he's got a bag, and it's bloody looking. Like, I'm guessing that's his dead cat. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Dead this, cat. This is one thing that didn't really make much sense to me, because he, like, takes the cat, he gets, he goes and picks it up, and then he just throws it away. I'm just like, what was the point of that entire scene? It's like, so, throw he, it away. He, someone was following him, and I can see why he didn't like that. 
He was just like in a hurry. But I don't care. Really? I really, I really don't. If you're in a hurry, you don't just go throw your dead cat in the trash can. Well, it's not going to matter much, anyways. I, so, I know. Um. So Colt, it's like someone's following him, and you find out it's Droplings following him, and so he goes into this museum, and he just fall. He's going through and everything. He's trying to hide from him and everything. And he tries to get out the back door. Yeah. But Joplin had caught his him and caught his fingers and slammed the door shut and cut off a couple of his his fingers in the process. Yeah, like four of them. Yeah, and um, of course after like that all scuffle happened and everything, you see Joplin walk out, picks up these fingers and a little napkin and just like takes and puts them in his pocket and walks out. So you think yeah. like something happened. Something happened here. And, uh, so then it goes to three days later, and Zero's waiting, like, he's dressed in, like, something different than, you know, his lobby boy uniform. And he's waiting by, like, this, what, what would you call it? It's like, like a, an old, um, it's like it used to be something that the prison uses, but not anymore. Like, it's old and abandoned. <laughs> yeah, like kind of, shack, I call it, like, shack old or, or something. something. And, um... So the men escape. It's actually kind of funny how they escape. They use this really long ladder. And they sneak through, yeah. like, the guard room. And they break through the bars. And climb along windows. And go through the laundry chutes. And um, they try to jump down to this hole. But there's a bunch of guards playing cards. And so one guy just jumps down to start, like, killing all the guards. Yeah. And, um... Um, so they get, they, all the guards are dead, so they jump down and then they climb out. And, um, they all, like, get out and everything, and, um, Gustav's asking about it, like, you know, do we got a safe house? We got disguises? He's like, no, that's all I got, it's all I can get a hold of. And he's like, gets mad at him. And he's like, well, he's mostly mad because he did not remember to bring his cologne. Yeah. He's like, you just let me walk around here all smelly and stuff. <laughs> like, yes. Yep. yep. <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, goes off on him. He's like, you know. And then Zero like explains, you know, why he had to leave his homeland because like it was like a war going on, yeah. and that his family was killed in the war. Like they're executed, and so. Gustav's like, well, I feel like an asshole now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they run off, and um, Edward Norton character, his name's Albert, by the way, um, he finds the hole that they had gotten through, and he's like, okay, we need to find Monsieur Gustav. Yeah. And um, Joplin shows up at the jail. We're like, it's like, huh, he knew about this. No. And, uh, Albert saying, you know, he's, like, kind of suspicious of him, you know, and he talks about how Kolbeck was found dead in the, like, a, what, a sarcophagus in the museum, and he had fingers missing. Yeah. And Joplin finds the Mendel's box, of course, that had been left there, where it had the tools. She's kind of boring. Okay, so then he knows they're involved. Yeah. Um, so then the, um... Gustav and Zero, I like, they find this little phone booth, and he makes a call. He's like, I shouldn't blame you hearing this, but this is a, I like, we're in trouble. So he calls on the services of the Society of the Cross Keys. Yeah. Of course, it starts with uh, Bill Murray's character. Yeah. Yeah. This is where you get a lot, like, I mean, we've already had quite a few um, big names, but you get some, uh, short cameos and yes. this is like you know where we, like you said we get the bill murray one and i'm just like watching all these people go by and i'm just like hey i recognize him hey i recognize him <laughs> i just thought this part was entertaining um just in the fact to see how many people i could recognize oh yeah there's a bunch so many like i said even just a little bit part there's still a bunch of big names in here yeah. For sure. And so they crawling, like, they all make a bunch of different calls and everything, and then all of a sudden, like, like a little bit later, you see this car shop, and Bill Murray's character is there, and he's talking about how 
they found the butler, and they have to take a train to get there. Yep. And, you know, he gives him ties and everything, and he makes sure he has the cologne and everything. Gives him some cologne, and the cool part is that Gustav has some, and then he gives him to Zero. I'm like, aw, that's sweet. <laughs> um, so... It jumps to um, Dimitri's back at the house, and he sees, finally notices that the boy with, uh, you know, boy with apple is gone, and there's like raunchy picture up there. Yeah. He just noticed now. I'm like, really? I'm just like, that's a long time. That's a long to time not to not <laughs> notice something like that. It's like you, d- there's a, they're completely different pictures. I mean, like, boy with apple is literally just a boy with an apple. And then this other lady is, like, two women. It's not like he put a picture up there that you could easily mistake. Or, like, he put a fake up there. No, he just put whatever picture he happened to find up there. (laughs) It has to be the raunchiest picture. Yeah. Love it. And so, um... Um... It goes to, oh, they're on the train and everything again, and they're talking yep. about Agatha. And she's, um, meanwhile, she's packing a bag and everything, you know, getting ready to leave. And uh, if you find out that uh, um, the butler's sister was killed, and yeah. that, because um, then you see that um, Joplin had, like, this telegram from the butler saying that where he was. And so, that's how he found out where the butler was, too. From sister. Because he, he cut her head off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he cut her head off, Michael. Like, well, this is just getting worse and worse with these murders. Yeah, it's just like... <laughs> so, that's the thing about this, is like, this movie, picture-wise, is so bright and colorful, but story-wise, super dark. Oh, it is. That's what I love about it. It's, yeah. like, light, pretty colors, and then there's, like, murders. I love the contrast <laughs> of it. It's, it's pretty great. It is. I like that. Um, so they get to, um, they get off the train, they get to this observatory, and they have to get on this cable car, and these cable cars cross each other, and they're, like, asking, like, are you Major Gustav, like, yeah, every single the, time. All the, monk, the monks or whatever. <laughs> all the monks, and they have to switch cars, and they put on robes. And everything, and they just keep asking him. He's like, God damn it, I want to know where he is. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I know. He's like, yes, I am him. Where is he? And they're like, go to confession. He's like, well, I'm sorry for cursing, but he's like, no, go to confession. He's like, yeah. oh. And they see in the, the confession box. Um, and uh, the butler's saying that there was a second will made. Yeah. In case of uh, that she was killed. And so, and then he's like, <laughs> he's like, okay, so like, where the hell is this other letter? And then all of a sudden you see that the butler's gone and you see they've fallen out because someone had killed him. Yep. And you, of course you see Joplin there. So you got to assume it's him that did it. Yeah. Yeah. Joplin killed him. And so you see this, I actually like this part. It reminds me of his other movies. So, they, um, Joplin gets these skis, and he, like, goes down the mountain on these skis. And then, uh, Gustav and Zero use a sled. Yeah, that's right. I remember that part. And they're, like, like, sliding down and everything. I'm like, this is awesome. This is some good cinematography here. I was like, what in the world are you doing? This, again, this reminds me of his other movies. It's, like, similar things. It's just, like, so ridiculous. Exactly. (laughs) And I was just like, no. That's why I like this part. Because it's ridiculous. You're like, wait a minute. Okay. (laughs) So they're sliding down, and um, the sled accidentally, because it's going so fast down this hill and everything, that, you know, Joplin's able to stop because, you know, he's got skis. He's able to control it. But they're on a sled. It's hard to control that. And yeah. so the sled kind of goes off, and then somehow, I know Zero gets off, and, but um, Gustav was, like, he kind of gets off on this cliff. He's hanging off the cliff, and uh, and Joplin's just trying to just, like, knock him off this cliff and everything, and um, 
And so after that, like, uh, <laughs> he's just talking to him. He's like, you know, I'm like, oh, he's like, okay, you know. And uh, Zero just like comes in, and just like toy, just like kicks Joplin off this cliff. Yeah, just completely kicks him off. He's like, oh, thank God, help me up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, Albert comes and he finds them there at the like the mountain. So they take um, Zero and uh, Gustav take this motorcycle that Joplin had been riding, and they take it down and everything. And so. They try to, you know, get the getaway and everything, and and what jumps to this part where um the mill, like you know, all those the military and everything had taken over the Grand Budapest Hotel, so yeah. they're thinking that um Gustav and Zero are gonna come there, and uh, Agatha goes to the hotel, and yeah. she gets it because that little paper that um, Zero had given her had the combination for the safe. Yep. And so she gets the painting out. And, and she has to, like, try and sneak it out of the hotel. And the and uh, Zero and Gustav are in this little Mendel's car and everything that she drove there. Yeah. And they're, like, in uniforms and everything, disguised. And, um, and they're like, we can just hide in here. And then Zero's like, uh, probably not, because, uh, guess who shows up? Yeah. <laughs> Dimitri yeah. shows up at the hotel and like, well, great, yeah. now we gotta get out of the car. And so he sees, Dimitri walks in and he sees Agatha has the painting, so he just go, like follows her and she's like, shit. <laughs> yeah. And then they end up like, all of them end up upstairs. Yes. Um, what, like, fourth and fifth floor or something like that? Sixth floor, I think. Um. And this part I thought was pretty funny. Like, nobody really asks any questions. They just kind of all start shooting they at each other. They just shoot. And, sh- <laughs> and none of them are hitting each other anyways. Yeah. They're all completely missing. And I'm just like, oh, so it's stormtroopers. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Agatha had gotten out of the window, but she was, like, hanging on. And the picture yeah. was right there, too. And um, so... And then Zero went to look for her, and he gets out the window, too. They're both hanging there and everything. And uh, they drops down. They both drop down into the thing, and so is the picture. And you see on the back of the painting, there's that envelope. Yep. Because this is the part where I was like, well, where did that even come from? Because <laughs> I didn't see that part earlier, because I was writing something down. And so I was a little bit confused, and I was like, you know what? It's a movie. Whatever. It could have magically appeared there, I guess. <laughs> it's like, no, it actually did appear there, you know. But, <laughs> you just, you know, you having said that, it makes sense, and I like that. Because, you know, sometimes in movies, stuff does just magically appear there, you know? So I was like, well, that makes me appreciate Wes Anderson. He, like, actually thought everything through, and he's like, well, we're gonna make this a real thing. Like, somebody actually put that there. So that, I liked that. See? See? So, um, so <laughs> they read, they find the second will, and they read it out loud, you know, everyone's grouped together, and they find out that if she had been murdered, everything had been left to Major Gustav. Yeah. Everything. And guess what else had been left to him? The Grand Budapest Hotel, which she had owned. Yep. Yep, she had owned it, and so, and then it talks about, you know, how... He, <laughs> Mr. Gustav's, you know, stopped being the concierge and everything, and, you know, he started acting like, well, he's rich now, so yeah. he got to act rich, but he didn't get to use his money for long. And it talks about how um, he talks, Zero says how him and Agatha got married and everything, but then what happened was they had had a son, but then they both, Agatha and the son had got killed, and um, they were killed by a disease. Yeah. And then he's... And you know, like, 1930s, they didn't have the medicine we have today, or even, like, 60s and 70s. Um, they didn't have the same medicine, so it was it was harder to be able to cure something like that. Like, now, I bet you, if this was placed more, like, now type thing... Oh, shoot, they would have well, been fine. You know say A lot of this story probably wouldn't have even happened, but... In that case of the baby and Agatha, they would have been fine. Yeah, they would have been fine, but this is the 1930s. So, yeah. and then before they had died and everything, you know, um, 
you find out what happened to Mr. Gustav. And so they were riding this train and everything, and um, yeah, Gustav admits he's like, you know, I did start out as a lolly boy, and I worked my way up and everything. And so they're on the train, and this is the Lutzblitz in November. And, of course, more soldiers show up. <laughs> And Gustav's like, you know, I got this card and everything. And they're like, because again, Zero's papers still aren't, like, you know, all up in line for theirs. You know, correct for them. He's trying to defend him again. He's like, I have this card. It should be fine. And they're like, yeah, no, this is not going to work. They, like, rip it up and everything. And so they just, like, the soldiers just, like, hit Zero and everything. And Gustav's trying to defend him and they shoot him. Yeah. And he dies from that. And so, since Zero was um, Gustav's heir, the Grand Pudisbest now belonged to Zero after Gustav had died and everything. And so, it goes back to the old, you know, the older Gustav, I mean, older uh, Zero and uh, the young author. And he's like, well, you have all these riches and everything, you know, the, like, they had taken everything else from you at the Grand Budapest Hotel. Why was that? And... Zero's like, I kept it for Agatha. Yeah. He's like, we had all of our best times here. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. how cute. <laughs> and so he's like, you know. And then after that, you find, you know, the author is like, after he spent his time at the hotel, he wandered off. And he's like, you know, he found where that room was and everything that Zero had stayed at. And it was a great room. And he's like, you know, like, he's able to go back to the hotel and everything afterwards. And really appreciate the hotel even more. Yeah. And then it goes to, this is the very end, it goes back to the girl at the very beginning that placed the lock, uh, the key on there, and she's reading the book. So it looked yeah. like she had been reading the book this entire time. Yeah, and we were just like in her mind imagining it. Yes. Which I think is a really, really cool concept because... That's the thing I really like about books is the fact that you everybody reads and interprets things differently and this is like her interpretation of this book and we get to see someone's basically I mean we don't know specifically but we get to see somebody's imagination at work is basically what Wes Anderson is trying to uh show here and I was just like oh I like that a lot like that right there is my absolute favorite part of this movie. Well, good. <laughs> I was just like, that is a really cool way to interpret uh, something and make your story come to life. Is like this is how like, this is how she interpreted this book, like, even though it's not a real book, and I was disappointed that it wasn't a real book. <laughs> I just thought it was really cool that that's the way he took this and made it seem agreed agreed all right so music alexander desplat did the music for this um he is known for the king's speech from 2010 argo from 2012 the queen from 2006 and philomena from 2013 uh, he is currently working on the French Dispatch and held for a moment. Neither of those have release dates, so my guess is within the next two to three years they'll be coming out. Uh, then, let's see. His very first uh, ever movie that he composed anything for was The Land of William Tell from 1985. And he did win two Oscars. Um... The Shape of Water from 2017, which I absolutely loved that one. It was great. Me too. Uh, the music for that was amazing. And then, of course, this movie, The Grand Budapest Hotel. So, he also did some of the Harry Potter movies. Yeah. Like I kind of said a little bit earlier, as I wasn't a big fan of the music from this. Like, it made sense with what was going on, but I think just the fact that it was a very comedic type movie that just kind of made me a little bit less inclined to like the move like the music because the music <laughs> played along with the comedic part and I don't like music like that so 
I wasn't a big fan of this music, but I'm not saying that it wasn't Oscar worthy. Like he did a great job playing with what he had. So I'm not going to take away from that. Like I can't take away from his Oscar. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they thought it was worthy of an Oscar. Yeah, they, so. I'm not going to take away from the fact that they thought it was worthy of an Oscar. I'm just, in my personal opinion, I did not like the music. Yeah. But I also can agree with them half the time anyways, with their Oscar picks. So yeah. I mean, they snubbed Ray Fiennes on this movie. Not giving him yeah. at least a nomination for Best Actor. Okay, I was wrong about which ones he did. He did both of the Deathly Hallows. Oh, music. okay. See, I knew it was, like, later films. I just remember, I thought it was, like, four or five or something like that. But I was wrong, so. Okay. <laughs> so, comparison. Um, like I said, it's not a real book. And I was super disappointed because it wasn't a real book. Um, so there's not really anything to compare it to. I mean, other than his other films and I guess the style that he does, if you want to do that comparison. But I haven't seen any of them, so I, don't, I can't speak to that. Um, a lot of his movies use like this like nice kind of brighter, kind of like uh, pastel color schemes to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of similar colors. Um, there's a lot of, like, this, um, similar, um, like, it, it's the same director, so of course a lot of filming styles. Like, I can yeah. relate, um, especially, like, that chase scene with the sled and the sleigh. Um, there's other films of his that do similar things like that. Um, the comedy in this is, I will admit, Kat, sorry, is oh. similar to his other movies. Okay. Again, to me, it's not in your face. You have to really listen for the lines. And you don't always catch them. That's what I like. Because sometimes they talk so quickly and the comedy is just like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. You have to catch it. And that's why you got to watch the movie at least a few times to catch everything. Because every time I watch it, I always catch something different. And I'm like, ha, I didn't catch that before. Nice. You know, mm -hmm. but... That's what I can compare it to his other films. Okay. Um, so, trivia. You had um, one, I know. Go ahead. Yes, I did have one. Um, Wes Anderson kind of made this, like, a little fun camp. Like, they in the area they were staying in, um, they filmed this. They tried to film this in an abandoned hotel, but they couldn't find one. Uh, so they filmed it in, like, some warehouse and built the hotel rooms inside of it. Um, but they whole, like the whole entire cast and crew stayed in another hotel that was very close by. So they were always like really close in contact with each other and just, he kind of made it like a fun environment in that it was kind of like summer camp. They were all staying together in the same place and constantly with each other and he made it, um, to, I think they were required to stay there. I think is what it was. But I thought that was kind of cool that he's just like, hey, you guys are all going to come stay in this hotel while we're filming this movie. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's all I've got for trivia on that one. Um, I got a few. Okay. So, um, do you notice that... I, this, he actually does this with his other movies, too. Um, so... Every time there's a newspaper headline... Or an article, it oh, tells yeah, what exactly yeah. is going on, and he wrote all of it himself. Yes. All the events in the headline, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, he said he wrote it because in case someone wanted to pause it and read the newspaper headlines, there would actually like read the actual newspaper in the movie. There'd be something that they could read, and it would be like an actual made up thing for him. Yeah, I, I like, actually stop really sometimes and read it, and I'm like, oh, well, that's exactly what's going on. See, because he yeah. has, he's detailed like that is great. He does that. Yeah. And um, another one, speaking of Tilda, um, she, with her old lady makeup, it's probably one of the most expensive things in the movie. Um, she spent five hours in the makeup chair. Well, old age makeup is hard and it's hard to get it right because you have to put all of the wrinkles in the correct spot because if you don't, then it just like looks like you just put wrinkles on their face just to put a wrinkle. So you have to like take the actor's face into account and then 
build the makeup on what they would actually possibly look like when they're older. So it takes a while to do that. It does. I watched I watched I watched a makeup show so I know a lot about movie makeup. <laughs> I, was like, I don't do anything with movie makeup, but I watched a show about it for the longest time. It's not on anymore, but they would like do explanations and stuff and it was like a learning experience as well as like a competition show. So I was like, Oh, I'm learning so much <laughs> even though I would never do that as a career. I'm like, I just appreciate the the craft and the hard work it's put into it. That's what I like. Yeah, I love movie makeup. Like, it's it's wonderful. Face Off. It's a sci-fi TV show. You can watch it on sci-fi.com. If you haven't watched it and you like movie makeup, you should watch that show. Boom. Um, we're not being paid for that. I just wanted to say it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know how it says Budapest, right? Yeah. Um, Prague was actually the inspiration for this movie. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it does, too. Um, this is a cool music one, by the way. I always like this. So, he always tries to use, like, different instruments. He always, like, asks, like, the composers to ask, like, use instruments that are related to, um, like, the area that they're working with or something, like, specific. And this one uses a, um, an instrument called the balalaka. It's a string instrument, three string instruments, triangle shaped and everything. And um, it's played in like Russia and France, so like in that area and everything. Yeah. So you can hear it in the movie, and it's actually really cool. I found that it's a cool part. I always like to listen for instruments that you don't normally hear, and that's one of them. And you can really hear it in um, the ski thing as they're going down. Yeah. You can hear it. It's like that weird string instrument. You can't really relate to anything else. That's it. Yeah. That is a cool fact that he likes to use instruments from different, uh, you know, regions, depending on where the movie is at. Yes. Um, I already mentioned this one in a, when we were talking about it, you know, that she actually had to learn how to make these pastries and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's about it. Because there's, like, other stuff, but... Like I said, there's a bunch of cameos in here, so... Yeah. It's, like, so many cameos. So many. Like, even there's, like, a little bit parts, but still, there are just, like, so many of them. Because, yeah. what was it? I know... Where is he? I know Owen Wilson's in here. Yeah, he's in here. I thought that was funny. Um, Owen Wilson likes to do a lot of Les Anderson films, if you did not know that. He does. Well, I, I did not, because this is the first one I've seen. So. Well, I'm telling you now, he likes to do them. He does. Okay. Yeah, just a heads up. So if you like Owen Wilson, he does a lot of these films. Yeah. Okay. So, one little fun fact. It's just, just really about our podcast, not really about the movie. Um... The only other movie so far that we've had that came out in 2014 was our very first movie, uh, PK. PK! So this is the same year as PK. I thought that was kind of cool. It's like, well, I mean, 2014 <clears throat> was an interesting year for movies, I'll say that. Yeah. I mean, you go from PK to the Grand Budapest. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a big difference. There is a big difference. There is. I mean, PK's got a little comedy, but it's not a comedic film, I would consider it. Yeah. Uh, another little fun fact from our show. This is the eighth highest votes for any of our movies at right above 640,000. Oh. Uh, just above it, the... Seven movies above it, Donnie Darko, Catch Me If You Can, Terminator, Monsters, Inc., Mad Max, Jurassic Park, and The Truman Show. So good movies in there. Yeah. I like some other shit films we've had lately. <laughs> um, I think that is all. Okay. The little fu the facts that I have and everything. So Those are some cool facts. I like it. So where it has been on the list before, obviously it came out in 2014, so it couldn't have been on the 2010, 2012, or 2014 list. 
So 2016, it was number 202. 2018, it was number 188. And as of today, when we are recording, it is number 191. So it's, so it's just chilling. <laughs> it's staying around the same place. Yeah, right in the same about 20 or so. That works. Previously, number 192. From the 2010 list, The Hustler from 1961. From the 2012 list, The Artist from 2011. From the 2014 list, a Hachi, A Dog's Tale from 2009. Boo. The 2016 list, Spotlight from 2015, which is what beat this for Best Picture. Yes. Uh, the 2018 list, The Bandit from 1996. And as of today, when we are recording, Memories of Murder from 2003, which um, we have had huh. before as well. Yeah, we have. That was a South Korean film. Yeah. So, favorite line? Oh, I gotta count mine. I think I have, like, three. <laughs> so I'll go first. Okay. Um, I suppose you'd call that a draw. I'm gonna blast your candy ass once and for all right now. Nobody move. Everybody is under arrest. <laughs> I like that line too. That was funny to me. Yeah, I thought that was, was funny. So, um, I got a few. One, two, three, four. Four of them. Um, she was shaking like a shitting dog. Um, I go to bed with all of my friends. Uh, you must never be a candy ass. <laughs> and this, my last one. The most dreadful and unattractive person only needs to be loved, and they will open up like a flower. Okay. You want to pick this one? I think I picked the last one. Um... I well, like the I did line. because it was aliens, so I picked. I picked the. You last did one. pick the aliens pun because <laughs> it was stalker, and I was just so pissed off by the end. So, um, I like the line. I go to bed with all of my friends. Okay. So, what is your rating? I I, I give this like um, I'm giving a solid eight. Okay. I am solid eight. Um, like I said earlier, I love Wes Anderson films. It's, I'm very happy we have one on the list because he's a director that more people need to know about. Um, he just, like, I just feel like he gets under the wire a lot of the time. Like, cause, you know, you got, like, big directors like Steven Spielberg, you know, and, like, I mean, nothing against Steven at all. He's a great director, too, but there's others out there that need yeah. to get noticed. And he always, like, dominates everything, like, but, there's other great directors out there. Yeah. Like Wes. He's amazing. Um, great color scheme. Great cinematography. Love the acting. I loved Ray Fiennes in this. He's great. I loved seeing him in like more of a comedic role. Um, I did like, there was some like, some nice like sentimental things, you know. Especially when Zero's talking about Agatha. I thought that was really cute. Um, like this time around, when he was talking about her, I actually got sad. Like, <laughs> and I never got sad before about it. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I know why. Because I can relate this to my own life. Because that's how my grandfather was about my grandmother. So that's why it made me sad. But other than that, I really like this movie. I do. Again, I always recommend it to anybody. Okay. Always have. So, right. Solid eight. Um, I'm going to go with a six. Um, I did enjoy it. For the most part, but the comedy in it was a big kind of no for me. Like, I just was <laughs> not feeling that. Um, the cat. I was the cat. pissed. I was I know. pissed about the cat. Um, but like you said, the cinematography is great. A lot of the acting is great. Um, the color scheme. And then the ending... I really, really liked the ending of that. You get that part where the girl is sitting there and reading the book and 
you get to basically you like it's it's your own interpretation but basically what it is is it's her imagination and i think that's a really cool way to interpret something so i liked that a lot i think just the comedy just took it away took me away from it is what it was and i can see that for you i can <laughs> but yeah i mean it's not a terrible movie like it's good it's good and i liked it but it's not one that I will watch again very soon, mostly because I've got so many other things to watch. <laughs> but <laughs> it would be, like, if it was on, I would watch it. Like, if somebody just like, oh, hey, let's watch this movie. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, we can watch that, whatever. Like, it's not one that I'd be like, uh, no, I don't want to watch that. So huh. that's, that's a good thing. You're open-minded about it. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our next film is Stand By Me from 1986. So that will be out next Saturday. It'll be our first October episode, so that's going to be fun. Uh, It's not really an October movie, in my opinion, but... (laughs) (laughs) It's just how it is. Yeah, that's okay. We got plenty of October movies to watch, so it's okay. Oh, I know. Um, don't forget our mystery line. Make sure you guess this one. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. So make sure you take a stab at that one. Our next event coming up is, of course, our Halloween event. Seeing as how it's so close to Halloween, and I'm so excited for this one. This one's my favorite one that we do. Same. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's great. I'm so excited. Um. I'm excited for Tuesday so I can start my horror movie watching, my Halloween movie watching. I'm excited. Yes, October 1st. Okay, but anyways, so yeah, our Halloween event is coming up. It will obviously be out on Halloween. The two movies that I picked for this year are Beetlejuice and Hereditary. And I picked Young Frankenstein and A Nightmare on Elm Street. And update on that, I am going to be, I'm on track to finish all of them by the time we record. Good, good. I, yes. sh- I might be able to watch a couple of them. I'm going to try it because I don't know if you're going to try and watch the remake. But I am I'm not. Gonna- I have seen the remake and it's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. So I'm going to try and get that one done since you're not going to watch that. As and I'll like try if- and get some other ones watched too. If you can watch the remake and Freddy vs. Jason, I think we might be covered for all of them. Okay. I can, I can do that. Thank you. Because like, so I, I have watch- seven. To watch. <laughs> yeah, I like, I'll watch... Uh- Freddy vs. Jason and uh, the remake. Because, I mean, I don't care. It's horror. I'll watch it. I don't care. Okay. (laughs) Deal. So, yeah. That will be... Those four will be out on Halloween. It'll give you some suggestions for uh, Halloween movies to watch. Um, Also, uh, if you guys think that there's one that's just, like, super awesome that maybe... I mean, it might be impossible that I've never heard of it, but maybe we haven't heard of then suggest it and maybe we'll take it into account for next year's Halloween event. Maybe. If maybe. It's gonna, if it's I was gonna. like, I already have one I want to do for yeah, next year. Yeah, I have year, one but... I know I want to do for next year. It's probably the same one I'm thinking. I'm not sure, though. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll have to talk about it. After this. <laughs> so, premium. We are offering premium. If you would like to become a premium member, you will get uncut episodes, early release episodes, and a special monthly episode all for a dollar a month. Also, you can pay $5 a month and pick a movie of your choice to join us for every 50 movies. So, um, make sure if you're interested in getting any of the bonus episodes, uh, hearing our opinions on some other movies besides just these, you sign up for premium and you can just go to our website and do that. It's on the right down at the bottom. There's the two different ones. Uh, so our special monthly episode for October. So not only will you get our Halloween event, but you will also get a special monthly episode, which will be one of the movies that I really did not ever want to watch again, but I did it anyways. It is Batman and Robin. <laughs> yes. I sat down and watched that movie, unfortunately. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I have to laugh. That'll be out. I'll probably have that one come out on October 30th, since we have our Halloween event coming out on the 31st. So That works. 
Uh, ratings and reviews. If you could please leave us some ratings and reviews, that would help us out greatly. It gets more people listening and being able to find the show, um, as well as it lets us know how we are doing. There are some things we could do better on. There are some things um, that you guys like and you don't like, so we just want to know what that is. If you could leave us ratings and reviews, that would help us out a lot. Uh, so you can find us everywhere. You can contact us, talk to us and stuff. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. and We try to keep those updated quite a bit. Uh, try, I try our best. <laughs> I try to make sure every week I post something on there for you guys to see. Mostly it's just what movie we're doing. But yeah, you can check it out. And if you are curious about some of the older episodes, I think we're possibly getting to where they're getting kicked off of some things. But they are all going to be on Podbean. Cat and Jess talk the best dot podbean dot com. That is our website. You can get every episode there, as well as some cool information, like um, all of our past favorite lines and stuff like that. So check the website out. Also, our music is by Audio Binger. You can find him on Facebook, YouTube, and his website audiobinger dot net. So thank you all so much for listening. And we will catch you next week with Stand By Me. Bye. Bye.